But the first thing I would say is you need to understand what triggers negative thoughts. Somebody says something and immediately it takes you back in time to when you were a little kitty and somebody criticized you or didn't choose you for the football team. So in my book, I talk about the very first thing you need to do is to have a check process. As an example, there is one that's known to a lot of people called DISC, D-I-S-C, Dominance, Influence, uh, Stability, and compliance. And where do you fit in that? So if you've been a person who's been a very dominant leader or a very dominant manager, and suddenly here you are lying helpless after a stroke, and people are taking control, part of you may be fighting anything that is there trying to help you. This is the Recovery After Stroke podcast with Bill Gassiamis helping you navigate recovery after stroke. Hello and welcome to Recovery After Stroke, a podcast full of answers, advice, and practical tools for stroke survivors to help you take back your life after a stroke and build a stronger future. I'm your host, three times stroke survivor, Bill Gassiamis. After my own life was turned upside down, And I went from being an active father to being stuck in hospital. I knew if I wanted to get my life back after stroke and back to the one I loved before, my recovery was up to me. After years of researching and discovering, learned how to heal my own brain and rebuild a healthier and happier life than I ever dreamed possible. And now I've made it my mission to empower other stroke survivors like you to recover faster, achieve your goals and take back the freedom you deserve. If you enjoyed this episode and want more resources, accessible training, and hands-on support, check out my Recovery After Stroke membership community. Created especially for stroke survivors and caregivers, this is your clear pathway to transform your symptoms, reduce your anxiety, and navigate your journey to recovery with confidence. Head to recoveryafterstroke.com to find out more after this episode. But for now, let's dive right into today's show. This is episode 172, and my guest today is Mike Cameron who is the author of the book, Effective Leaders. In this episode, we apply the concept of corporate leadership to stroke recovery for some useful insights that may help you in your recovery. Now, just before we get started, if you're enjoying these episodes and this podcast and you believe that it is useful, please leave the show a review on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts from. And if you're watching on YouTube, please give the show a thumbs up and share and tell me your thoughts by leaving a comment. I love reading them and interacting with the show actively rather than just listening passively. Passively will make a tremendous difference to how many other stroke survivors can find the show. Thanks so much and please enjoy this episode. Mike Cameron, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks very much indeed, Bill. Thanks for being here. You're the author of a couple of books that piqued my curiosity and I figured there's definitely a way to merge the your area of expertise into stroke recovery. And your first book is The Emerging Leader. And your second book is Effective Leaders. And I see leaders and leadership really merging with recovery because one of the things that I think a stroke survivor needs to do is do self-leadership. If that's such a thing, I don't even know if it's a term that's commonly used, but it's part of the task of taking responsibility for your own recovery. And a lot of the responsibility in recovery from stroke or any uh, serious ailment is outsourcing the responsibility for me getting better to somebody else. And that usually involves a doctor. And fair enough, because they put themselves at the top of the pyramid of recovery when you have something serious like stroke happen. And for good reason, because they are scientifically trained and proven to be able to improve outcomes for people who have a stroke. But then there's this situation that occurs that we outsource all of that on them in some cases and don't take responsibility for our own recovery and then miss the opportunity to lead ourselves out of 
this really challenging and serious situation that we find ourselves in. And it often creates a feeling for some stroke survivors, or for me, at least of not being in control of anything and not being in a position to guide my own life and kind of feeling in somebody else's hands and they don't really know how I want to structure my life going forward or what I want to achieve or what my challenges are coming into this and what I have to overcome. So can we talk a little bit about your definition of a leader first, what you think a leader is so that we can kind of frame the conversation going forward? Yes, uh, I'd like to do that. I think firstly, the most important thing to understand, and I think why you're asking me to talk about uh, ultimately leadership of self, you can't actually lead other people until you know how to lead yourself. So the importance, first of all, is to understand, one, who you are, what you are, what you want to achieve, what your vision is. Uh, regardless of where you are in life, whether you're at a supervisory level or whether you're at executive level, whether you've come from university or so on. At some stage, you will interact with other people and how you interact with other people ultimately is from a point of view of yourself first, how you think about yourself, how you've managed your development and what are the things that trigger the negative thoughts that go into your brain when other people communicate with you? So you ask me, what is leadership? Leadership is the privilege that you are given to be able to guide people to an outcome, a group, a team. Uh, it may be a very, very large organization that you have accountability for. And one of my recent posts, uh, there was a, a comment from Simon Sinek that talked about being a leader was understanding that the team, other people create what your vision is. Your job therefore is to allow them the space to do the job you want them to do. One, because they want to do it for themselves and two, they want to do it for you and the company or the business, whatever. So leadership is about giving up the doing of the job, finding the people who can do the job, nurturing and supporting them, and allowing them to have the responsibility of the delivery of what you've communicated to them. Now, you're accountable for choosing the right people, and you're accountable to your manager for your selection of the outcome being achieved. So if, if you think about it and you are allowing somebody else to do the job, sometimes you're going to be a coach, sometimes you're going to be a mentor, sometimes you're going to be the subject matter expert. Listen, John, I'll show you how to do the job, but you're not there to jump in and micromanage and you're not there to do more than support, coach and monitor. That's, my, that's what I think a good manager is, a good leader is. Um, and then we can start talking about self-management. And what do I mean by all of the things that allow you to em empower other people? I love what you said there because I can automatically superimpose that onto recovery from stroke. So I, in my 10 steps to recovery from stroke, I have this, uh, I have, one of the steps is creating a community of people that are going to help you in your recovery move, and move forward. And, one of, and part of that community includes the doctors. Part of that community includes family and friends. It includes um, allied health professionals. It includes masseurs. It includes coaches, counselors. It includes spiritual leaders, if that's the case, if that's you know something that um, appeals to you. It includes anybody that's going to guide you, whether they are involved uh, 
um, in a in a way where you have specifically recruited them or pay them to bring you further along in your understanding of this situation that you find yourself in, or they just happen to be there. It's this community that I put together that I chose that I'm leading towards my vision of recovery. But one of the things that I think I've missed is what my vision of recovery was. I don't think I ever actually reiterated that or even spoke about that once to any of the people in my group or in my team, my recovery team. And I especially didn't have a conversation with my doctors about what my vision for the future was and therefore help inform them about how I wanted them to support me in my recovery. And then from there, help me overcome the brain injury and all the different things. So, so there was a key element that I think was missed there that I think now looking back that if I had had that conversation, I think it would have decreased the amount of time that I was searching for, for purpose and meaning and all those other things because I hadn't ever developed a vision for my life after stroke because stroke was this thing that caught up with me suddenly and I never really came to have the space to work out what was going on I had to go into reaction mode to make myself not die and then to get myself back into some kind of uh existence that I felt was meaningful. Yeah. Let me ask you one other thing, just um, when you first realized that you'd had the stroke and you were starting to be supported or uh, you had doctors around you who were taking control of trying to get you back to being stable and so on my thought process would be that you would have to really look internally to what you were trying to do and that did it align with where other people were coming to try and support you. Um, I've had two serious motorbike accidents in my life, very serious motorbike accidents. And on both occasions, I have bullied by becoming the executive I bullied the medical people to allow me to leave hospital before I should have left hospital uh, because I was under so many drugs that were pain killing. And yet the reality is my body was so badly damaged that it wasn't until I got home uh, and then started um, coming out of the pain uh, killers that I realized just how painful life was. And in fact, on the last time, I couldn't even move. Um, so one of the things about leadership and knowing yourself is to know what sort of person you are. Because when you suddenly are in a situation where um, you need the help of somebody else, the support of somebody else, are you feeling um, less less yourself are you feeling fragile are you feeling fearful are you feeling lots of things that are negative to you accepting that person's help so it regardless of whether we're talking about somebody facing a stroke situation or whatever the first thing i would say is you need to understand what triggers negative thoughts somebody says something and immediately it takes you back in time to when you were a little kitty and somebody criticized you or didn't choose you for the football team or, or whatever it might have been. Um, so in my book, I talk about the very first thing you need to do is to have a check process. It can, there's lots of models around. I'm not particularly pushing any one model but as an example, there is one that's known to a lot of people called DISC, D-I-S-C, Dominance, Influence, uh, Stability, and Compliance. 
And where do you fit in that? So if you've been a person who's been a very dominant leader or a very dominant manager, and suddenly here you are lying helpless after a stroke, and people are taking control, part of you may be fighting anything that is there trying to help you. So yes, there's certainly things we can talk about, about how do I manage those feelings and why am I feeling them? And that gets us into uh, emotional resilience, emotional agility, emotional intelligence. And what do I mean by that? One of the things that often impacts stroke survivors is obviously the in a state, most people who have a stroke are in a state where their mind doesn't work, it doesn't think, it doesn't operate the way that it was before the stroke. And that that's usually in the acute phase. And then you kind of come out of that and you start to get your, your thinking mind back and it starts to settle down. And what I find that also gets in the way is the emotional resilience part of the recovery is a big barrier to people in stroke recovery. So often knowing yourself is something that generally seems to be missed by the people that I've interviewed on the podcast, the 170 odd people that I've interviewed so far, generally they miss knowing themselves because they haven't had the time and space in their life to get to know themselves. What they've done is they've become a, a parent, they've become a full-time employer, full-time employee whatever they've become and they've not really given themselves the opportunity to de dive deep and know themselves and know where they sit in the world and how and how the world needs to be organized around them so that they feel like they're achieving amazing uh, an amazing experience in life right so they often then don't know their visions and their values because they're running somebody else's visions and values you're in a work environment and you're trying to achieve your company's visions and values. And then because you have had these experiences from your life when you were a kid and you didn't really understand what was happening when you weren't getting picked up for the football team, you, you developed the opposite of emotional resilience. And some people have gone into their adult life with the same behaviors and habits that they used and were useful on the football field when you were 10 years old and haven't realized that those emotional outbursts or behaviors aren't useful anymore in life. They're not any more relevant when you're a 30 year old and you need to upgrade that level of your, your way of being or the way that you interact with people, but they often don't know how to. So they get stuck. So when I'm saying, when I'm using the term they, I'm really speaking about me, Mike, and I'm, I'm describing myself. So when I found myself in stroke um, recovery, I had to contend with these three things that I wasn't doing well. And now I had to have this communication with my doctors, which I couldn't possibly do effectively because I was experiencing a bleed in the brain which was impacting my ability to just think cog cognitively, but I was also lacking these other things that had already um, not developed enough of by the time I was 37 years old, because I never knew that they were important. Yeah. Believe it or not, Bill, there are so many people who become leaders, become senior managers, who are 37, 40, early 40s, whatever, and they still have not actually ended up knowing enough about themselves. And they fail. And they fail because ultimately they try to do things which they have no understanding of how to do and shouldn't be doing anyway or, be, or have difficulty in communication with other people in a way that asks a lot of questions for which they don't have answers. In other words, how many managers do you know that are prepared to say, we need to achieve so-and-so, what are your thoughts? 
How do you think we should do that? Because the people they are asking are the people that actually are going to do the job. Now, you might know, you might have even written the guidelines on how to do a particular job, but the reality is you're not going to be doing it. It's going to be a team of people or an individual or whatever. And too many people who have not understood what a leadership role is stay in command rather than in fact making sure that the people that the task is delegated to somebody in a smart way and by that i mean is the task i'm talking to you about specific is it measurable that in a way that you know when i want it delivered at what quality level at what standard is it actually achievable do you have the tools, the time, the skills, and all of the knowledge to be able to do that job in terms of resources and, and competencies? The next one, is it realistic? In other words, a lot of times we dump on people rather than checking what their to-do list is like and how many tasks they have. And the final part of SMART to me is the most important, tangible. And by tangible, I mean, I, what I mean by that is what's in it for the person doing the job? Do they feel that, in fact, it's a valuable task that they're doing? Do they feel it's part of the overall objective of what the company's looking for? Do they feel part of the deal or do they just feel they're a cog in the wheel and they're being dumped on? Now, that's, that's how you allocate, uh, how you delegate a job and ultimately empower the person to do it. Yeah. And I suppose what I'm really trying to say in leadership, until you get to the stage where you're not fearful of delegating, fearful of, of empowering somebody who might, in fact, become smarter than you and move on, um, you're not going to become that real key leader yeah, I love that analogy, because the smart method of setting up goals and achieving goals and getting to an outcome in goals is so applicable to rehabilitation. Yeah. And again, these are conversations that I didn't have with my um, therapists, but they did kind of skirt around these outcomes in a way that was almost specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time-bound. The one thing that I think shouldn't apply to stroke recovery is time, mm -hmm. because it seems to be what trips a lot of people up. They put time onto the recovery process, and then when they don't meet their goal or their milestone for some people it seems to be a reason to get down in the dumps and depressed by that mm -hmm. and it gives them a bit of a setback in their recovery but i don't know anyone that i've spoken to that specifically set out to create specific goals for recovery that were measurable where they were able to look back on those and see how far they've come that were also achievable and that were relevant because most of the recovery is designed and implemented by people that didn't have the stroke that perhaps didn't have enough time to consult with you about how you wanted to go about your recovery and what's missed in stroke recovery is the emotional and psychological recovery. There's a massive focus on the physical recovery because that's what your therapists can see, but there's a very small amount of that that's focused on, okay, if we manage to get that person walking again, what else do we need to do to help create a well-rounded recovery or a fuller recovery 
and there isn't much focus allocated to the emotional aspect of it and the psychological aspect of it. People seem to stumble their way around that. Let me just uh, throw one other thing into the melting pot before we move away from know yourself and goals. If you've had a stroke and you're in recovery, you'll know what a scary and confusing time it can be. You're likely to have a lot of questions going through your mind. Like, how long will it take to recover? Will I actually recover? What things should I avoid in case I make matters worse? Doctors will explain things, but obviously you've never had a stroke before. You probably don't know what questions to ask. If this is you, you may be missing out on doing things that could help speed up your recovery. If you're finding yourself in that situation, stop worrying and head to recoveryafterstroke.com where you can download a guide that will help you. It's called seven questions to ask your doctor about your stroke. These seven questions are the ones Bill wished he'd asked when he was recovering from a stroke. They'll not only help you better understand your condition, they'll help you take a more active role in your recovery. Head to the website now, recoveryafterstroke.com and download the guide. It's free. Sometimes when I'm uh, consulting with somebody that's been promoted up to an executive position, I will ask them, or, or if I'm talking to somebody who's setting up a new business, they, they're leaving corporate life, they're going to go off in their own way. The, the same questions fit into both categories. The first thing you say is, where am I now? Where am I? What, what's happened to me? What have I done? Where am I now? And there's lots of things around that that you can look at. The second is, where do I want to go? And the third is, how do I get there? Now, if we are, so those three questions, I think are absolutely critical for you as the stroke victim to try and understand and ask enough questions of people around you to support you is how do I get there? Because I know what I want to achieve is the recovery. Yeah. Now, maybe it takes a while if you're that, you know, um, in such a state that getting your brain working properly. But what I'm saying is those are the three stages. Now, let me just go back to the goal setting, the goal planning. The most important thing with goal planning is to turn it into focus goals, something that you can achieve within 24 hours. Not what can I achieve in a week? What can I achieve in a month? What can I achieve? What do I need to do today to move one step forward towards the bigger goal? And to limit the number of those focus goals that you put on yourself, depending upon where you are with resources and your strength and your energy levels and so on. So, yeah, it's goals are still smart, specific, measurable, achievable, retainable, uh, uh, realistic, I beg your pardon, and uh, time frame. That's, that's a goal. Yeah. But what I am asking you to think about is break those down into something that is very achievable by the end of the day and make certain that um, you put it onto a priority list. If you've got a, a number of things, you're getting to the stage of being uh, in recovery uh, and you've got lots of tasks. Some of those can be missed. Some of them can't. Some of them are top priority. You need to have finished that. So you need to prioritize and you need to know at times what you can leave behind and what you can't leave behind. Yeah, I like that. Those small goals, those daily goals, those really easily achievable goals will make you feel like you've achieved something and reflecting exactly. back, you'll have a few quick wins on the, run, on, the, on the scoreboard and therefore you'll be able to um, stack those wins up and you'll be able to get some momentum towards achieving things. And Absolutely. then when you have a setback, it won't be such a bad thing that I had one setback, but I've actually had 10 wins already. So 
let's just keep going for the next one and focus on how to get that outcome the one where what what do i want what, where am i now where would i prefer to be and then how do i get there yeah so, and and that's part of that emotional intelligence bill and you're absolutely right most of us if we've got a goal that we fail on because we've made it so far away or it's so big that it is very difficult to get there um, we start making our mind think that we are failing when we have a setback whereas if you have a focus goal at the end of a day i feel really good if you end up at the end of a day and you've missed one focus goal out of five or out of six focus goals you miss one what you start thinking about now is what could I have done better? What could I have done to have established? Was that goal a little bit of a challenge, a little bit beyond me? Had I communicated correctly with my doctor, with my um, massage therapist, whatever it might have been, you aren't blaming yourself. You actually are in a stage where you are now working and you're in a positive moving forward. Now, I'm not a person that believes that life is all full of positivity. I, I'm not. That's not where I come from. So there is a reality. At times, life's going to be tough. But if you break things down and you know that you are going to come up, what's my plan B? How do I handle something? if I don't achieve or I'm not achieving what I want to, is it okay to go back to the drawing board and redesign how do I get to? And of course, it, it's absolutely right. Yeah, it's definitely okay to fail. It's definitely okay for things not to be, always be going good. Stroke yeah. really creates a lot of things that are not good and they, they can be overwhelming the same time i think it's really important to focus on what is good and if you if people that are going through some tough things can stop themselves for a moment and say okay what's good about this situation even if what's good about it is i'm learning something new well then that's good enough to take you to that next level of cur curiosity for example what else can i learn about this situation what else can i learn about myself what yes. else can i learn about the thing that i didn't achieve or what can i learn from applying what I've already achieved and how much further can I go? So um, I agree with you that there's no such thing as just, you know, the positive mindset and the focused mindset on recovery all the time. There's got to be that time for reassessing everything. And I think what helps you reassess and readjust your trajectory and work out your, your path forward is those setbacks. I think that's those setbacks Absolutely. are the ones that help you actually get more focused and better um, targeted and better aimed at the ultimate goal, which, for example, for me might have been, you know, just to get back to, you know, nice and big, broad goal at the beginning, just to get back to being a good father. And then yeah. everything yeah. else can come after that. But if I can be a good father, that's pretty easy to achieve, even though I'm recovering from stroke and everything is really difficult. And perhaps I can't go to, to the football field and play with my children and take them on that trip that I was planning to take them on and spend some time with them in this specific location or during this uh, specific event. Well, maybe I can just be a good father by telling them I love them or yeah. more and apologizing for the things that I'd done in the past that, you know, maybe as a dad, I mistreated them or, or didn't give them the, the correct amount of encouragement or whatever. So I love that idea that actually part of the, the moving forward are those steps back. Well, let's just take, because what you've talked through there is, is three forms of the uh, emotional intelligence family, if you like. Emotional intelligence is um, understanding, first of all, what is triggering things inside you what are you hearing what are you reacting to and the second part of that is what is my strategy to manage 
what the impact of somebody doing something or my reaction to something. How do I manage that to stay um, comfortable within myself? Okay, so those are intrapersonal skills that you need to learn. On top of that, to be an emotionally intelligent person, you have to have empathy for other people. You have to understand where you sit in a group of people. It can't be all about you all the time. And you need to have effective communication and understand your role in that team environment and so on. That, that, that's emotional intelligence. Now, emotional intelligence and what we've talked about so far, life isn't just beautiful. Even if you've got all these skills, every now and again, somebody is going to do something from left field that is going to annoy you and you lose the plot for a moment or you react in a way that actually wasn't beneficial to you, the group or whatever. And or the other person may do that to you for no reason at all. Now emotional resilience is being able to manage the situation of disappointment, of not getting what you expected, uh, of dealing with that, whilst you're also dealing with those inter, uh, intrapersonal things of how, what's my reaction to it and what's my strategy so I don't create a problem. Now, in today's world, we've moved one further step, and it's a vital step, and I would say a vital step probably when you are needing other people, and that is moving to what's called um, uh, emotional agility, and that is realizing your place in a group of people. What's the atmosphere you choose? What's the environment you create? You were talking about sometimes you might feel that I need to talk to the kids in a way because I haven't done particular things. Now, in emotional agility, what you are actually also going to analyze is, am I doing it for the kids or am I doing it for myself? In other words, am I doing it because I think I ought to do it and I'm feeling a bit guilty so I'm going to have this uh, emotional uh, love in or say things. Now that's all about you. It is not about the relationship or how you want the children to feel. Mm. Emotional agility has come from the space of, am I seeing that the kids actually would love me to give them a cuddle or would actually love me to ask them more about what they've been doing? because I haven't been able to go out with them or whatever it might be. So those sorts of things, Bill, are in my view, and quite a lot of it's in that first book of emerging leaders, is moving into that space of understanding the basics, emotional intelligence, there's really two keys, then move up to emotional resilience, and then move to the stage of uh, emotional agility you know i'll give you a lovely little story can you imagine a boss who is uh walks in talks to everyone one day how are you going bill and asks you a few things eventually gets to his office and for the rest of the day you don't see him next day he walks in head down whoom, 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 whoom. he goes into his office the door slams and then he comes out about three hours later and he shouts at somebody to come into his office. Ooh, how are you feeling about that particular boss? What's going to happen the next day? So you are in a situation where you are wondering about how that person lives, if you like, in the environment. Is he uh, consistent? Is he uh, predictable? Or is he in an emotional imbalance for the group that he's in? In other words, he really doesn't understand the impact he's having in the space in which he's working. Not only do I, can I imagine a, 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 lead, a boss like that, I've experienced a boss like that. Yeah. But now that you mention it, and now that we're kind of merging leadership with stroke recovery and 
my desire to recover well and be a better version of myself after the stroke. I can imagine, I can, I can remember times when I behaved like that at home, not only at work, but also at home. And came home one day, all happy, cheerful, and all that kind of stuff from work. And then came back home the next day, being completely shitty, head down, angry, annoyed. And for all intents and purposes, everybody else around me is thinking that pretty much everything is the same. And they don't know what it was that caused me to, let's call it misbehave or behave inappropriately. And then not communicate what my problems were, and therefore create this barrier around me, where people were working, walking on eggshells. And I suppose I became more aware that I was acting out or misbehaving after the stroke, because it became important to me to actually be aware of how my conversations were impacting my kids. And I didn't want them to be impacting my kids in a negative way. And it was definitely about me, because I wanted to make sure that if I dropped off the planet, that they were going to at least have a decent uh, experience with their dad and remember me fondly more than the other, right? But at the same time, I wanted to make it about them so that they wouldn't have to deal with stuff for no reason that was actually not their fault. And then they'd, and and that would then hopefully minimize the scarring that I would create in their life and therefore hopefully minimize the possibility that they would be dysfunctional in society at work with their relationships later on in life. Yeah. <coughs> Bill, what, what good coaching is all about is for that awareness that you've just talked about isn't, isn't unusual by the way. It happens lots and lots of times to lots of people. And ultimately, until you actually understand the impact it's having on other people or on your team or, or whatever, it will also be having a huge impact on yourself. Because until you understand it and until you come up with a strategy. Now, when I'm talking to uh, either a group or I'm talking one on one and I'll do it now. I ended up being uh, very successful with ICI uh, in the explosives division of ICI and running a group that looked after quarries and construction and coming up with some new ideas and building teams. And sometimes I was really frustrated and sometimes I would go home at night and I would want to uh, and I would tell my wife all about the negative things and I would dump on her. Now, can you imagine what her view of life and what her view of the company and what her view of the team, uh, and this is at the early days of that whole development was, she had a view that there were some pretty nasty people in the company and that the company wasn't really looking after me. And I was dumping on her with all the negativity whilst I was at work being this open uh, manager that was all, you know, all light and open and come up. I've got an open door policy, but I wasn't living the truth. And at the time I was carrying a lot of stuff and I had a heart attack. I had a heart attack at 54 because my body eventually said, we're like inside you. I was all tensed up. And the point I'm making that in leadership from emerging up to, through those is to understand how many things you've done through your 20s, your 30s, your 40s that you've managed, but the reality is they're not doing you any good. And you're not actually becoming that effective leader. And you won't until one, you know it. And you're honest about it and you say, I really don't handle that very well. There are times that my strategy isn't working, dumping it on your wife, dumping it on your partner, dumping it on your right hand man, woman, 
in the office is not the way to be a good team leader. It's to actually have strategies that work and support you and move forward and ultimately allow you to talk up in the right way and ask for the support you need or the resources you need and give enough empowerment for things to be done in the, in the way that they should be. Yeah. You know, the empathetic relationships part of your model is a really interesting one because it's one thing being empathetic to others, but also having self-empathy is really important, isn't it? Absolutely. Because if you're constantly beating on yourself and saying, you know, I'm shit at this or I'm terrible at that or look at how, look at how you can't do anything, well, this is not going to support an active um, recovery and it's not going to support an active recovery mindset. It's not going to align the person with the goals that they set that were measurable and so on at the beginning of this whole process, you know, and I think that there's a lot of people who have experienced a stroke and are so hard on themselves simply because they experienced a stroke. They kind of allowed themselves to have a stroke or they created the environment to have a stroke. Now I created the, environment to make the stroke that happened to me more possible because I was born with a blood vessel that was faulty in my head but then I created the the perfect storm around it to give it the best opportunity to bleed but if I was going to stay in that space then this could have potentially been even more catastrophic Whereas it was important for me to let go of what I had done and take some responsibility for my actions, but then also change something so that I don't continue to feel bad about what I'd previously done and, and stop doing those things in the future so that the shift could be moving me towards recovery rather than yeah. staying in that space. Yeah. Let me just go back to your, your word about empathy, because people quite often misunderstand the difference between empathy and sympathy. And there's a huge difference. Empathy is, I understand the pain. Now you might understand it because you've actually dealt with, uh, it might be a doctor seeing lots of people who are going through this, the, the stroke situation that you've you've experienced they can be empathetic about the pain and the struggle and the and the challenges you're going through it's empathy they haven't experienced it but they've experienced other people doing it and how they manage it um, sympathy is where you've been a stroke victim and, and here's another stroke victim and you get into the mire of the feeling and all of a sudden you're adding to the pain because you're starting to talk about your experience and all the things that didn't quite go right for you in your recovery and this person is only on the start of the journey and there's a lovely little cartoon that I saw many many years ago about this person that had gone down into a big pit um, and there was a manhole at the top and he was crying because he couldn't find his way out and somebody was walking past and he was he, he shouted down and say are you okay oh i can't see my way out I, i'm i'm all lost and he started crying out for help now the person who is sympathetic immediately goes down the, the manhole because he can see the ladder at the top and off he goes and he goes to the voice and he's now as lost as the voice was because they're in the darkness. Whereas the person who's empathetic looks up and says, hang on a minute. And he gets his mobile phone out and he puts the, the camera light on and he shines it down the, the walkway and says to the person down below, can you see the bottom of the ladder? Yes. Well, walk over to it. I'm up here to talk to you when you get up top. That's sympathy. I understand your problem, 
sorry, that's empathy. I understand your problem. I'll help you get out of it, but I'm not going to climb in and wallow in the pain that you're feeling. So e empathy sounds like it's it's actually encouraging the person to. It's actually teaching the person to fish, whereas sympathy is Absolutely. giving the person the fish. Absolutely right. Spot on. Spot on. Right. It is a massive distinction. I love that. I. I kind of understood the difference between the two, but that really paints a clear picture as to the difference between the two and how one should behave when you come across somebody who's doing, who's doing a tough or going, going through difficult times. It's um, definitely better to teach them how to manage the difficult time on their own rather than putting Correct. your hand on their shoulder and, and showing to them, just come with me, I'll get you out of this mess. Ask them questions like, next time this happens, how do you think you'll manage it? Yeah. What could you do different next time? Yeah. 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 Love Tell that. Them. So how does motivation and teamwork come into your model of leadership? What is that about? Okay. There's a, a very good example. Um, first of all, you can have a carrot or a stick approach to creating motivation. Both of those are short term. If I give you lots of carrots, in other words, money to go and do a task, ultimately that task has no value other than the increased money I've given you and you want more, okay? Um, I can get a big stick out and say, if you don't do it, well, look for another job. Okay, so there's the one or the other. And the reason that they can't work for me as the boss, me as the person trying to get that motivation with the group in the long term is it's not personal. Personal comes from how do I give you, how do I create an environment where what you've wanted to achieve in your life, you're being given the opportunity to do. In other words, if I say to you, Bill, would you like to run this section of the, of the office or would you like to be responsible for doing a particular thing and give you the ability, the tools, the training, whatever it is to do the job, have I created an environment that becomes motivational for you to develop your own skills, your own way of doing something, do I need to tell you exactly how to do it? There will be sometimes I do it from a safety an occupational health and safety viewpoint. Yes, there might be in some processes a particular need to carry it out in a particular way. But apart from that, what I'm really saying is create the environment for motivation because it then becomes external. It becomes you doing it. It's not me forcing the issue. Yeah, I like that. It's about finding ways that are going to motivate people to move towards something that they want to achieve, experience, yeah. and then layering all those things in and actually more importantly realizing what's missing from that um that group of things that are going to help motivation so for example in my recovery what would have been missing the most uh, was the right the right surgeon so initially i began the process with um having enough of an understanding of what I wanted from in, in my recovery, what I wanted to know that the initial surgeon wasn't the right surgeon for me. The way that they were communicating, the, the way that they were understanding my vision, the way, the way that they were um, being uh, empathetic to my situation didn't suit me one bit and I couldn't have a conversation with them. They were having conversations about me at the bed with other people and I wasn't being involved in the conversation. So I felt out of the loop. So what I had to do was I had to find the right surgeon so that I could tick off another one of those things in my checklist for how I was going to go about my recovery. And it had to start with 
the surgeon that was going to open my head. Once I found that person, then I was able to move forward to the next part of the decision, which was to actually decide to have the surgery. And it took me three years to decide to have the brain surgery. And that was three years of risk where I had to risk the possibility of another bleed and a more catastrophic version of a bleed and therefore um, more debilitating illnesses and all the stuff that goes along with a catastrophic bleed in the head. So um, that part was how I motivated myself to actually get the surgery. Constant communication, lots of empathy from that person really enabled me to become emotionally resilient, helped me achieve my vision and my values, and then kind of supported me to get to know myself in this situation, in this recovery, so that I can um, trust in myself when I was leading myself out of this deep hole that I had suddenly found myself in. And that brings me to the last part in your in your model is the trust in your leadership. And that is really interesting because a lot of people will second guess what they're doing and how they're going about their recovery. They'll second guess some aspects. Some people will second guess all aspects. And when they're doing that, that really doesn't support a really great outcome. So how is, how do you build trust or does that actually emerge from putting all those other things in place? Absolutely. Um, and you gave a perfect example of trust in your leadership by you taking that three years. Um, I'm not saying everyone should take three years. No. What, what I am saying is, if you go back to that first thing, where are we now? Where do I want to be? How do I get there? Then the how do I get there is all of the stuff that we've been talking about. Know yourself. Have enough uh, enough understanding of your emotional capacity to deal with the challenges in a way that you can go through the fear and through what uh, the the walls that are coming up the next thing is I better and improve communication so that you're actually starting to work with people who you're trusting now that's actually leadership because ultimately the outcome you want is yours. In, in this particular case, it's your own life and your own particular recovery from, from stroke. But sometimes I don't want my bigger boss telling me how to then tell a whole pile of other people. I have built an environment where my boss knows he can trust me to deliver what I'm going to do. So trust in my leadership is who am I going to delegate tasks to? How am I going to check that somebody has the skill, the tools, the understanding, the ability of what I want, you know, in your case, the things that you knew were a risk for you of not having boxes ticked. That was important. Now that ultimately in leadership terms is what's called transformational leadership. The transactional stuff, how do you actually do a particular task can be easily done. Somebody's got a certificate tick, they should be able to ask some questions. Yes, that doctor knew exactly what the next doctor or surgeon knew, tick, tick. But what they didn't have was an ability to communicate with you that got you feeling that you were part of the equation and were being understood and that that person was talking to you in a way that you felt, hey, it is all about uh, a team thing and I happen to be the, you know, very much a key of this whole thing. So trust in your leadership is all of the other six things. Yeah, all of the other six characteristics. It's knowing yourself. It's having a vision for what you want to achieve. What's the outcome I'm trying to achieve? It's on the other side, it's being able to communicate effectively. It's having the emotional intelligence to be able to have people um, 
sometimes come to you like like you were with this surgeon initially and saying, hey, I've got some questions and he doesn't even understand why you should. You're just, you know, you're not a surgeon. I really don't have to explain it to you. Well, whoa, hang on. I need to understand the process. I've got a brain and I need to let it let it be, you know, sorted out. Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that emerging trust that occurs when you put those other things in place. And it, that's where I found myself. I did find myself really trusting my decision making, even though my head wasn't really working properly, even though I had cognitive issues, my decision making seemed to be working really well. And I made the right decisions moving forward. And I never regretted any of my decisions. They, mm. It meant that I had to experience two more brain bleeds between the first one and then brain surgery but it wasn't the end of the world the fact that i experienced those and then had a lot of setbacks and a lot of fear and a lot of concern and obviously the risk of dying from that right um but overall we worked it out now that model that we spoke about um has at the top of the model results and performance and then in the middle of the model has another triangle that has trust, purpose, alignment, conversations, and engagement. That model was the one that basically allowed you to write the book, The Emerging Leader. Yeah. And then you've added some stuff to the model that's taken that model to the next level, which we'll talk about now, which led to the book Effective Leaders. Let's talk about now what takes the model to the next level. What are those four additional things that enhance that? Okay. The four things is, well, first of all, one of the things I would put it into workplace engagement that you just mentioned in that triangle of the first model. And trust is absolutely a key. But it got lost, if you like, in, in the model. It, it's fine when you're just talking about the seven characteristics. But if you look at it for effective leadership as a total uh, um, goal, then it has to be the foundation. So first of all, we have to have trust and trustworthiness between what, what I do and how you know, I walk my talk what I say I'm going to do. I mean, if you think about what, what do I mean by trustworthiness, dependability, reliability, um, lack of self-interest, um, consistency, they're, they're the things that are fundamental to trustworthiness. Uh, I'm not manipulative. I, I don't work in my communication to get you to do something that really isn't in your best interest. Okay, so there's the foundation. Now on top of that, mainly because of, I ended up with a lot of people coming back to me and saying, I really like that first book, Mike. I really like the book, but you didn't tell enough stories. Now I told quite a few stories in the first book, but writing a book when you've never done one, uh, one is quite a challenge. And two, I had a lot of things I wanted to get out as a guide. There's four guidelines uh, in the book, the first one. And so there were things that I could have talked about, but it probably wasn't the right time. Whereas people coming back to me and saying, oh, you know, have you ever experienced, you know, uh, such and such? And I'd say yes. And, well, it really took courage to be able to do that. And so I started thinking about to be able to actually do the seven things that are characteristics of good leaders actually took respect. By respect, what do I mean for, uh, about respect? I've, I've analyzed it in the second book, The Effective Leaders, by saying it covers diversity. It covers gender equality, gender equity, gender equality, uh, gender uh, inclusion. 
why should a man get paid more than a woman to do exactly the same job with the same qualifications? There's no reason other than e equality. Why are some jobs which are virtually uh, considered female jobs paid at a lower rate than really their value is? The other thing with respect is culture. There's lots of cultures in, in Australia and a lot of us don't understand the culture. In fact, we get frightened about the fact that somebody wants to pray in the middle of the day and somebody else wants to uh, not work on a, a Saturday or whatever it might be. Everyone has the right uh, in Australia or should have the right to look at their culture. The one thing that I can't understand as I'm, and a, and a migrant from Scotland to Australia, and I came out here in the late 70s, was I saw the place as basically um, a fair go until I'd been here for about a year and started realizing that there was some deep down division. It was okay if you'd been uh, an Irishman. It wasn't quite the same if you were an Italian. It wasn't quite the same if you were a Slav or whatever. Uh, you play soccer rather than football. The, there must be something slightly wrong without understanding the different cultures. Now, my brother's actually married to an Aboriginal lady um, who, when I first came out here, I really didn't understand what she was so passionate about. She's now an elder in Tasmania. And so I decided in the book to go to uh, an Aboriginal elder and say, what would you, if I gave you the space to put an article together, what would you want politicians to actually understand about Aboriginal needs, Aboriginal culture, uh, Aboriginal uh, empowerment, rather than what is happening in Australia regarding that? Now, without becoming politic, all I'm really flagging is there are questions that good leaders, effective leaders, need to understand that their vision of... Uh, let's say an Anglo-Saxon way of doing things is not necessarily the right way for other people in Australia. Yeah, the color of your skin shouldn't determine it. The next real key takeaway of these four attributes, as I call them, is courage. It takes courage sometimes to say to a boss above you, I'm not happy with that that does not align with what the company's values are. I can't ask the team to do that because we haven't got the right resources and I'd be putting the people at work risk. Uh, I'm, I'm happy to ask the team to work for a certain length of time doing overtime if they'll do that, but to do it long-term is detrimental to their health, their well-being, and their safety overall. So I stand up for what I believe is right, and what I'm responsible for. It takes courage. It takes courage sometimes to bring somebody and empower them to do something and step away and give them the opportunity and not micromanage them. That takes courage. The next key attribute is integrity, being transparent being trustworthy, being aligned with what you say you will do. Yeah. And the final one is agility. Now, agility is a buzzword in today's world. But what I mean by that is the ability to talk up and talk down and talk across in language that people can understand. And it's called style flexing, so that you can communicate in a way that lets people understand what you want, where you're coming from, and so on. In leadership terms, that's absolutely critical. 
in emotional terms, emotional agility is having that ability. We talked about it earlier on that ability to understand where you are in a bigger group of people. And finally, in terms of uh, the agility, in terms of um, the overall effective leadership, what parts of what we're doing relative to the characteristics and so on, do I need to be agile in at times? So what I'm saying is, life is going to bowl you up from time to time the difficult challenge of having to lay somebody off having a difficult conversation when things aren't working um, do you throw that to somebody else throw it to the hr department or whatever or do you have the courage and the leadership agility to be able to have those difficult conversations and either rectify what the problem is or communicate in a way that doesn't go and throw the blame upwards or sideways that actually the person moves on but realizes you've done your best to make sure that they understand you've got their back you've got put in place some support as they move on to a different job or whatever it might be yeah i feel like this second aspect of our conversation has shifted quite a lot from where I tried to merge your model of the emerging leader into self leadership and my recovery to now I think, I feel like this really fits really well with people who are supporting others to recover, especially the aspect of the diverse nature of the Australian community. And when you're trying to apply rehabilitation tools and services to, you know, this such a diverse society that if you have a model that's not flexible that's not agile that isn't able to respect everybody's differences and isn't able to um, be be used by the entire community that it's really going to fall over it's not really going to support um, the majority of stroke survivors to overcome the deficits and the challenges that they've um, uh, have experienced because of the stroke and I feel like it's 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 a beautiful model for people who are leading in those roles of uh, supporting occupational therapists and pers personal uh, therapists to um, understand the role that they play in um, in having an open mind and having a a methodology that actually takes all these things into consideration and then when it doesn't and when you've spent some time implementing something that doesn't work or isn't as inclusive having the courage to recognize that and then make changes where it's appropriate and even if that means it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of effort what i can do is um we can still start that process by just acknowledging the fact that hey maybe the model is awesome for supporting um, the majority of the uh, Christian uh, population, but there's a there's a there's a portion of the Muslim population who wouldn't be comfortable with male personal therapists, for example, rehabilitating female stroke survivors. And maybe we need to allow for that and find a way to Absolutely. make that possible by giving them a space within the facility that allows them a to um, be rehabilitated in privacy that serves their uh, religious views or their um, uh, their, their um, what's the word their um, cultural views and also um, allows them to not have to worry about this additional layer of I'm not going to go down this path of recovery because I can't do it yeah. under your current model. And therefore that minimizes the possibility for them to have the most resources thrown at them for recovery. Yeah, no, I, I'm absolutely right. And in, in my view, um, there are going to be times when the courage side of that 
uh, is absolutely critical. The person who is coming up with the plan has the courage to be able to say to the hospital or to the group that they're in, these are issues that need to be taken into account. And when, you know, if you think about, I'm thinking of it from a leadership viewpoint, but um, minority groups at times feel almost privileged that they've got a role or job and, and are almost at times prepared to give up what, what another person would see as a given. It's their right. The other person says, oh, I'm not going to go and rock the boat because what might happen is I might lose my job uh, in the next round of uh, looking at things or when it's appropriate for the boss to, to get rid of some, of some people. I might be the first to go because I challenged something. So what you're looking at is in, in view, in, in my view, the model for the second book, the end of the first part of the, of the whole of the second book is a lot of effective leaders who were moved by my first book or were people who I knew from managing directors right down to guys that are supervisors on in quarries. Um, so I've, I've got uh, somebody like Paul Constantino, who was the chair. He's now the chairman of, uh, or was the chairman of the Quest Service Department Group. But he founded that company way back in the late 70s uh, and wrote, has written a terrific article for my book uh, on vision and values. Uh, and spells it out really well. So the first part of the book was lots of stories that reinforce the value of those seven core characteristics. And then what I've done for the four um, attributes that underpin that model is I got somebody to write, somebody who was a, a real subject matter expert on agility, somebody that would write on um, integrity. I got two people to write on integrity. I got people to write on courage. And I got people that would write from an Aboriginal viewpoint on diversity relative to culture. Um, it's so important, Bill, in my view, that and I think in this last 12 months, we've seen politicians struggling with open communication to Australians about what, what's important to us, what's important to us as a community. And they're still playing the politics, party-wise or whatever, of, of what they want to achieve for reasons that aren't necessarily what's important to the community. Um, and we've really got to get back to that. I think the leadership has let us down a lot in every level of government and regardless of which side of politics yep, exactly. you vote for and uh, or don't vote for. And it's happened globally. And we seem to be uh, following a similar path to what the United States is following by the amount of division that's occurring. And I think that everyone that I speak to will be... Um, and again, regardless of which side of politics they're on, feel really um, comfortable with agreeing the fact that division has never been uh, more, more so than it is now. And what we need is less division. We need to find where our similarities are and come together. Yeah. Um, and the, the challenges, I think that some of the challenges that I think I've overcome by interviewing now 170 odd people around this podcast about stroke recovery is that each and every one of them wants the exact same outcome for their life they want to live comfortably safely you know fed with a roof over their head dry um, with as little um, ill health as possible and they all had a stroke but the reason for it was all different. And each and every one of those people comes from a different background, a different part of the world, a different upbringing. But 
really there's not a lot that we want that's different everyone wants exactly the same things so knowing where where we where we the where we're the same should be the focus and yet what we're doing is focusing on where yeah. we, where we're different and i think that that self that leadership is lacking for self because our leaders leading us at state or country level are really not true leaders they seem to me to be pseudo leaders they're in a role that should be occupied by a leader but they don't actually have all the attributes necessary to make in my opinion a a, a true leader a, le a a real leader and therefore they are the unfortunate example of how we need to lead people but then also how we lead ourselves and we're getting caught up in this whole situation that seems to be solving problems on the short-term basis but isn't solving problems yeah. on the long-term basis and what we're doing is putting out fires and not realizing that every fire we're putting out we're lighting two more yeah and we're doing that to our personal lives we're doing that to our um, work lives we're doing that to our business lives and we're doing that whilst trying to recover from the complexity of a stroke yeah if you think about uh the other take the model the whole effective leaders model the foundation being trust and what you've just talked about is we've lost trust mm. we actually don't trust politicians we don't trust a lot of people that write stuff on uh, all, all the papers newspapers and so on that's the real big challenge we've got once we've actually done that the politics of how we have communication comes from leaders that are able to accept there are there can be several views about a particular subject but it's worthy of having open discussion about it and in the case that you were talking about you taking three years to decide what you wanted to sign off on because it was your life and you felt that you needed to feel aligned with the person that was going to put your life at risk really understand that they had your not just your best interest because probably the first guy had your best interest mm -hmm. but he didn't know how to end up creating that bond with you um yeah, yeah. And, and i think that's what our challenge that's why i'm writing these three books as a trilogy and then i will peacefully retire and just be me and ride my motorbike that's perfect mate i um definitely comes down to trust at the end that's what i think i've realized just now when we spoke about that is i did not trust that previous surgeon with that approach i did trust the actual surgeon who did open my head you know professor kate drummond and she just made it all about me she was the expertise in the process and she had the team that was going to um, deliver the outcome for me which was to remove this faulty blood vessel so that it doesn't bleed again and they were going to take all measures to minimize risk to my outcome and therefore i just felt like i could completely trust her and i literally put my life in her hands and i don't feel like i can do that with too many people when you're going through this and to be able to do that means that i go into that surgery feeling a lot calmer a lot more relaxed and i create a better version of myself so that they're dealing with a patient that's more likely to have a good outcome and yeah. then we and we get a better result overall so i love how we've merged your business books of in, on the topic of leadership into recovery and stroke recovery and then also um, into the rehabilitation side of it with um, the second book um, because i thought it was going to be a challenge but in fact it's quite easy 
to merge the two topics. The people that are listening to this have been led by people, are leading themselves, have been misled by people and have misled themselves. So hopefully they get a lot out of that. They've worked in corporations, they've worked for bosses and they've been bosses. So hopefully they see that these things that they've learned in the past are applicable to their recovery yeah. and that they can continue investigating how they can apply corporate leadership, effective corporate leadership into an effective recovery after something as serious as a stroke. Now, can I say one other thing? Uh, I'm in the sales mode at the moment, but um, I've got a special on up to as a launch for the book um, but it's going to run until the 19th of December. So it's, if you like, a, a Christmas special. Um, you can buy both the books. And if you're in the Melbourne area, uh, I will have them delivered for you. It gives me an opportunity to jump on the back of the motorbike uh, and take them out around Melbourne. Uh, I will deliver totally the two book deal free of charge uh, for delivery. Um, and I've got the two books going out for sixty dollars, uh, and then or sixty-one dollars, and it was then nine dollars to deliver them. Um, but I, sixty dollars, and I will deliver them free. Or you can go on to Amazon and buy uh, the Kindle version if you want to read it, and I think that's ten dollars. Yep, fabulous. And if you're listening from overseas, people can go to strategically.com.au and they can head to the page where the books are located and they can click the buy now button and they can get a bit of a, an intro into Mike and his work and um, they can pick up both books there and have them delivered as well. Is that right, Mike? That's exactly right. Now, the other thing as well, Bill, uh, for anyone that's listening to this and they go into that website you've just given them, strategically.com.au, and go into my books, there's lots of downloadable, free downloadables. There are videos. Um, there are people who have written articles and allowed me to uh, use them. And all of the references that are made in the first book are there for you to have there's no cost to any of that they're totally free downloadables fantastic mike thanks so much for being on the podcast no i love it loved it thanks very much indeed bill and good luck to you and your continuing uh, health recovery well thanks for listening do you ever wish there was just one place to go for resources advice and support in your stroke recovery whether you've been navigating your journey for weeks, months, or years, I know firsthand how difficult it can be to get the answers you need. This road is both physically and mentally challenging, from reclaiming your independence to getting back to work to rebuilding your confidence and more. Your symptoms don't follow a rule book, and as soon as you leave the hospital, you no longer have medical professionals on tap. I know for me, it felt as if I was teaching myself a new language from scratch with no native speaker in sight. If this sounds like you, I'm here to tell you that you're not alone and there is a better way to navigate your recovery and build a fulfilling life that you love. I've created an inclusive, supportive and accessible membership community called Recovery After Stroke. This all-in-one support and resource program is designed to help you take your health into your own hands. This is your guidebook through every step in your journey from reducing fatigue to strengthening your brain health to overcoming anxiety and more. To find out more and to join the community, just head to recoveryafterstroke.com. Thanks for listening and see you on the next episode. Importantly, we present many podcasts designed to give you an insight and understanding into the experiences of other individuals. Opinions and treatment protocols discussed during any podcast are the individual's own experience, and we do not necessarily share the same opinion, nor do we recommend any treatment protocol discussed. All content on this website and any linked blog, podcast, or video material controlled this website or content is created and produced for informational purposes only and is largely based on the personal experience of Bill Gassiamis. 
The content is intended to complement your medical treatment and support healing. It is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice and should not be relied on as health advice. The information is general and may not be suitable for your personal injuries, circumstances, or health objectives. Do not use our content as a standalone resource to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease for therapeutic purposes or as a substitute for the advice of a health professional. Never delay seeking advice or disregard the advice of a medical professional, your doctor, or your rehabilitation program based on our content. If you have any questions or concerns about your health or medical condition, please seek guidance from a doctor or other medical professional. If you are experiencing a health emergency or think you might be, call 000 if in Australia or your local emergency number immediately for emergency assistance or go to the nearest hospital emergency department. Medical information changes constantly. While we aim to provide current quality information in our content, we do not provide any guarantees and assume no legal liability or responsibility for the accuracy, currency, or completeness of the content. If you choose to rely on any information within our content, you do so solely at your own risk. We are careful with links we provide. However, third-party links from our website are followed at your own risk, and we are not responsible for any information you find there.